uh, I welcome you. I welcome you all to today's session on scaling from MVP to a full-fledged product. I welcome Anirudh Bhardwaj uh, from Rigor Club, who is the speaker of the day. I'll just uh, uh, quickly introduce our uh, speaker. Um, Anirudh Bhardwaj is the CTO from Rigor Club. He's a seasoned leader uh, with 12 years of experience. He's passionate about building tech platforms and weaving a story on how the power of technology can be harnessed. And um, he also helps in solving problems at scale. His experience lies in designing scalable software solutions, defining tech strategies for organizations, software development, and carving out infrastructure to operate at scale. Working with a team of highly professionals, highly skilled professionals, he likes to spend energy in bringing out the leaders within them by mentoring, motivating, and building their career roadmap. So this is a short introduction about uh, our speaker, Anirudh, who will be talking more on uh, defining app architecture at scale, identifying current product bottlenecks, improve uh, the developer productivity, etc. So I wholeheartedly uh, welcome Anirudh for the session and uh, all the participants uh, here. Uh, this is Ankita. I'm from uh, 10K Startups team. And uh, I request you to uh, uh, you know, uh, write your questions in the chat box, uh, which Anirudh will be addressing at the end of the session. So uh, yeah, without taking much of my time, I uh, now request Anirudh to uh, take the session ahead. Anirudh, over to you. Cool. Thank you, thank you, Ankita. Thanks for the warm introduction and thank you everyone uh, for joining. I think without uh, spending much time, we'll uh, just start with today's topic. So I hope my screen is visible to everyone and we can just get started. Yeah, it is visible. Cool, thank you, Ankita. Cool guys. Uh, so I think uh, a pretty common topic for uh, the startup folks uh, that uh, and a challenge that everyone, I think each one of us face when we scale from an MVP to a full-fledged product. And today, I think with my experiences over the past 12 years, I'll be talking about on how can we kind of find those challenges? What are those challenges at the first level? And how can we find those challenges? And then building a framework on we mitigating those challenges. Obviously the framework would help you mitigate a lot of challenges, but at the end we have to kind of define our own roadmap as well. This is our use case. So without spending much time on the problem statement, let's see how a life cycle of a startup or a product looks. For a typical startup, uh, the three stages, right? Uh, the first stage is obviously the ideation stage. When somebody, generally the founders, idea about the idea on what they want to build. Then as soon as they confirm that this idea is where they'll start building, they start getting into the MVP. Now this journey from the idea to MVP requires a lot of brainstorming uh, that happens between them, between the people who joined in the initial stages, those endless flow diagrams, right? Uh, the whiteboarding or maybe the Miro where we just carve out those endless flow diagrams, right? I remember me and Abhinav just building like hundreds of those flow diagrams to carve out what we want to build. And then in parallel, building the right team, building the team from the scratch. So I think this is the most, I would say the trickiest part that the startup has to solve when they're moving from the ideation to the MVP stage. So at this point, I think what we generally hire interns, we generally hire pressures who are energetic, have good sense of software engineering and just build the team, team with them. And then your development cycle starts, uh, you do the market launch, and maybe on an average in a 90 day to a 120 day time frame, you do your MVP launch. Now, once your MVP get launched, uh, there are times that those MVP uh, might not get successful, but most of the time when they get successful, the scale is uh, not what we predicted. It is like 10X or 20X of what we predicted. It is obviously not like in a multiple of, 2x, 3x that with a normal scaling architecture, we would have survived. Now, as soon as we hit that scale, uh, we move to the scaling problems, right? That this is the time when we start thinking about constructing those engineering principles, right? At this is the time when we think that yeah, we should design system in such a way that these microservices can scale. This is our core. 
we should focus on it. This is the database we should have used. Now let's just start moving towards that. And I think to solve that problem, what do we think? We just think that let's do, do hiring. We do we end up doing endless hiring, right? We hire more people, more people, more people without even thinking on what would be the end goal or what how our team will look after a couple of years uh, when we have just focused on hiring without actually defining a clear roadmap for each and every individual that is part of your team. The third thing, because the, of the beauty of these clouds, like the AWS or GCP or Azure, uh, you can scale up infrastructure, right? Even if you have not developed a scaled, uh, scalable application, you can scale up by adding up, adding up more servers, more servers, which eventually adds up to your cost. The first few years, you would obviously get some credits uh, from the AWS Start Program or the GCP Startup Program, but eventually this adds up to your cost, and that is the day when we wake up and realize, oh, now we have to focus on reducing this cost, and we have to now refactor, rebuild, refactor, rebuild. This process starts, we start, start focusing on refactoring, rebuilding the stuff. And because of which we start losing some of the time which we could have invested in building those core features or those additional features for the end user that would have helped us scale more multiple or in a multiples. At this point of time, I think most of us, I think at least we face this challenge, we would come in a stage where people, the development would go, go slow because of your inefficient branching strategies or manual deployments, or maybe not setting the right quality gating, right? Uh, people are just committing blindly into master, having a rollback, no, no clear strategy of how your branches would look like, how your CICD pipeline would look like, how your observability will happen, what happens if a user faces problem in production. In an MVP stage, I obviously it does not uh, affect that much because you know the limited number of users that you have and you can connect with them, ask them what is the problem they have faced and then, then replicate that issue. But when you scale, right? Uh, and I think we can talk about the scale of the uh, organizations like Airtel. When you scale to like 300 million auto users, right? You cannot just ask every user what the issue they have come. So these kind of things come to our mind once we have crossed the MVP stage. And this therefore uh, leads us in kind of slowing down our eventual way of methodology that we would have adopted when we have reached to that scale. Now, this is the Nirvana state that everyone wants, right? That there's a time, there's a scale, with time the scale happens and it is all smooth. What is the real state? The actual state is like this. We start, we scale. And then once we scaled, we dip because we might not have architected the right ways. We might not have designed our core microservices or core services in such a way that they can scale up to the traffic that we are going to get. And then this whole exercise of rebuilding, which we discussed in the previous slide, starts up. Now in the future, in the coming slides, I will discuss on what are those typical challenges that we face and obviously bringing them from our experiences on what all challenges I have faced have been lucky enough that uh, even with the larger organizations like Make My Trip and Etl, I was part of those startup like programs or projects in their team where I was able to kind of face that real heat and burn my hands. And using those experiences, uh, we tried solving most of the problem here at Trekker Club. Obviously, we haven't been able to solve 100%, but yeah, learning is a constant process. We tried learning those experiences and what we'll do, we'll try sharing those experiences and maybe share that framework with you that can help you scale up easily without wasting much time after MVP on the scale up. Now, what are those typical challenges that we fail when we uh, go from MV to MVP to a full-fledged product? We never built for scale. That is a valid use case, right? We thought that we'll just build an MVP, uh, do some playing around, and then if the idea hits, we'll then build for scale, which is a fair use case. Sometimes resources uh, like uh, num less number of engineers or maybe not adequate funding leads us to not build for scale, which is, which is a fine assumption, right? The second thing uh, which most of us does, because you know, as engineer, what we'd love, 
we love to solve the hard problems, right? We build overarching solutions. So for any simple problem that could have been solved directly or with a simple use case, we what we try to solve, we, we try to find the edge cases, right? Let's suppose we are building, so we built a trading platform, right? And in this trading platform, we try to find those edge cases and start solving for that. And we have eventually uh, presented our solution, started building on that. Now, after a few days, what we realized that the solution that we've built actually is catering that 1% edge cases, but it is impacting that 99% of the use cases, which could have been solved by a simple or a very easy way. So rather than simplifying at times, we just complicate things, which then impacts us whenever we want to scale. The third thing, obviously, is the first two, three years of yours will definitely be spent with those AWS credits. Uh, they're like dope that will help you kind of use these, those services more and more and more. And then suddenly one day when those credits get over, the cost has gone high. So being, um, so I've worked with few organizations where though uh, we didn't care about the infrastructure cost, but it was as high uh, as I think building an entire engineering team. So those kind of things people don't generally think about till they get to that level. And that is the trigger point when we see, oh, now it is the time to architect things in the right way. Let's build a proper scalable system design and then reduce this infrastructure cost. Now what we are doing, so if we take it in a real life example, what we are saying that the train that had started few stations back, now we have to take it back and start from there. And it is not that simple. I think most of us would agree. And it requires a lot of complication. Now, the fourth point, obviously, see, when we start the MVP, we really don't care about what coding guidelines we'll follow. Do we need to write a method that is not more than 10 lines? Um, do we need to be on an event-driven art architecture? Do, do we have a sidecar for kind of supporting the scale? Things like that, right? We, ne we never care about it. What we care, how can we develop fast? Let's use the MERN stack. Let's use the mean stack. And in a couple of days, we'll be able to write our prototype, right? This as a start is right. But this hits you when you go from MVP to scale. And I think most of us would agree, right? Those lengthy lines of code where you just endless lines of code. You just, I, I, I sometimes, sometimes get lost in those lines. Um, when, when, when we are reviewing, you get lost in those lines. And if you have to change one simple logic in those lines, I think we just make it more buggy. So I think not focusing on coding guidelines does hamper us a lot. The, the uh, second last problem that I have faced, in fact, in the initial phases as well, um, and facing right now is how do we scale up the team at the same time, upscale the talent of your team? So, you know, you hired brilliant people, you have, have given them promises, you have given them a charter on what they will build. Now they have been building something from last one year. Now to change their mindset and help them understand that how it will look like after an year, it's really difficult. Helping them scale up, you have to start from day one. At the same time, the second challenge, I think in tech, it is the most common challenge these days with all these startups. How do we hire better people? The every, every brilliant person has like 10 odd offers. How do you motivate them? How do you ensure that they join you and help in scaling up your entire system? The last point, I think, which we touched upon the previous slide as well, obviously, because of no DevOps culture or the no SRE culture, they're like long development cycles. It's like there are a lot of merge conflicts because of wrong branching strategies, lot of weights in the deployment because of limited development environments, the development to staging, no, no clear definition on what the QA team will do on the staging uh, environment, what the QA team will be doing on the development environment. And those kind of things just increases your development cycles and the predictability as the development cycles increases, reduces. So what we realized and what most of us would have observed that when we started, there was a lot of predictability into the system because it was a small team. The problems were smaller. The things were smaller. Now the problems have gotten bigger. The teams have gotten bigger and these deployment cycles have gotten bigger. And I think 
we don't even care about observability when we go in an MVP phase. Uh, we just think that observability can be built, built along with time. And this is the time then when you say that now we should implement logging, we should just implement pager duty, let's have data dog, things like that. And what we see that now what we are trying to do that in a moving train, we are just fixing, fixing, fixing more uh, levers to make it faster. So if we kind of see these common challenges uh, and a time graph on how can we kind of strategize. So there are four key points, which I thought I would be touching upon and discussing with you guys. And obviously uh, we can discuss and happy to have those questions at the later of the presentation. Uh, I think the first and foremost important thing, which is our foundation stone, that what are our day zero strategies? See, if we being an engineer in our entire life, are not able to define the day zero strategies that will help us build a five-year or a 10-year-old product, then there's no benefit of we being there in the organization. So we need to clearly understand what are those day zero strategies. Obviously, you won't build everything that is there in the day zero strategy, but you need to have a clear roadmap that these are the things that I need to have on my plate. Now then, in your everyday hustle, what are those things that your engineers, you, your engineering managers need to ensure in those everyday hustle to kind of inculcate in their living being, right? How can they kind of do things in their everyday hustle to make the things better? The third thing, obviously being a leader, I think anticipation act is an important aspect, right? Being a founder or a CTO or a head of engineering or an engineering manager, it is very important to anticipate what it, what it will look like if we scale. And when it will look like when we scale, what we need to do. And the last thing I think what we should avoid when we kind of scale. Now, typically your DRE zero strategies, I think the first important point that we should clearly focus upon, and this is something from my previous experiences, I've burned my hands in my previous organizations. When we didn't define the engineering, principles in the beginning and we introduced it a year later or maybe two years later when we thought there's a need of in introducing an engineering principle. Now at this moment what happens? The team that has been working with you is the same num same people, mostly some new folks, some have left but generally those same people have been working with you uh, in the starting of the years. You ask them to suddenly switch gear from one thing to another. Now, I think all of us know that it takes 21 days to change a habit, but those 21 days are when we really focus on changing that habit. Now, now at this moment, what is happening that your engineer has 10 odd things to do and at the same time, adapt a new principle. It won't take 21 days. Trust me, it takes months. And even if with a team of 10 people, 12 people, it takes months. So it is very important that you define your engineering principle. What will be the coding guideline? How would you architect? Will it be an event-driven architecture or a microservices architecture? You, do you want to do a monorepo versus you want to do a multi-repo? Define those things. Just keep a note of that, that thing and discuss with your team that these are some of the principles that we need to align. Obviously, we would not align to everything from day one because that would reduce our speed to market for the MVP. But as we keep on growing, we'll start incorporating these principles, inculcating these principles into our day-to-day -day life set. The second important thing is obviously define your system architecture. It is very, very difficult to change what system architecture you build. You thought that the event-driven architecture is jazzy, right? GraphQL is jazzy, everybody is using. Let's just go on GraphQL. Let's just have GKE, let's just have Kubernetes clusters. But do you really need it? at this point of time, or even if at a scale at which you are operating, would you need it? Don't just go by biases on defining your system architecture that this is the best architecture going in market these days, we'll define. Follow the proper system design principles, do those problems solving, list your requirements, both functional and non-functional, know your limitations and then build, and then define your system architectures. The third point is very interesting. Uh, I think till I was an engineer, I was a strong prophecy of not using these agile methodologies. I used to say that, why do we even do in sprint planning or sprints? 
when i know what i have to do i'll do now when i was working with these brilliant engineers from the last few years i realized that agile methodology need to be inculcated from day one obviously most of us will have a question that we don't even have a plan for next three days how can we have a sprint for two weeks so we can solve it two ways first let's at least have a plan for a month or if we cannot have it for a month have it for three weeks start with a one week sprint don't follow every ritual like you having a grooming and then you have a sprint retrospective follow those critical rituals at the time of the start that can help you adapt those agile methodologies because now your team from day one is working on the agile methodology whenever you kind of introduce one more lever of agile methodology there will not be much change for the team the fourth point is basically when you are building your system 90% of the things will be feature and 10% will be core so rather than focusing on building 100% right focus on building that 10% in the correct fashion in the proper system design methodology with the proper system design with the proper scalability security resilience kind of an architecture high availability everything but those 90% those will get keep on getting updated those will scrape at times so don't focus on them focus on your core strengthen your core and just focus on that technology selection becomes an important part it is not easy to move from node to java or from java to go or maybe from go to some any other language right it i think everybody knows know that right while we do a technology selection and when we think that now this technology is not scaling bases are scale right node is single threaded uh language we all know that right multi threading we have a lot of scale how do we scale now we move to uh, we need to move to go it is not that easy that decision obviously happening between the leaders is like a 5 minute 10 minute decision let's just move to go think about your engineers they have just now expertized or built their expertise in one language now you say say that say to them that dude this is over let's just start a new beginning so it is very important that you select the right technology at the right time databases right mongodb is famous these days it is solving all the use cases right we say yeah, we have a merge stack we you get node react mongodb directly integrate let's just go with it and you realize this we realized i think when we started building our uh, application we went with the merge stack uh we said okay let's just go with the merge stack it is easy to build our developers will just pick it quite easily and then after 3 months what we realized the complete data structure is an rdbms kind of a function it is a relational database that we needed to have now we have to shift thankfully we realized this after 3 months rather than realizing after 3 years because everybody know migrating data from databases it takes a lot of time and a lot of problems as well to the contrary i think most of us will say that mongodb also provide those kind of things using the aggregation pipelines or maybe using the transaction which they introduce in the 4.2 version bang on one thing we should always know that each and every technology to compete in the market will release all the features but they will function the best on the first feature on which their core is so if mongodb started with a document store they'll function best with document store if redis started as a key value pair it can support composite uh, indexes right now but it is purely supporting or would support key value pairs at scale so this is very important which database to select which queue to select which language to select and this is something which you should spend time upon i think as an engineering leader one should spend time upon how it should be done the last and final thing i think which is most critical and this is something which bites us ba- our back if we don't do it at an adequate time is defining your data and cloud security how should your data be encrypted where your data will be stored who has that access to data how can your data be tweaked how can your data be leaked are we doing those enough vaps penetration answer those those hard questions think about those hard questions and i think uh, when it come out cloud are we having everything in a militarized zone do we have a private vpc for our 
data sets or is it on public VPC? Do we even understand VPC? How hard is it to implement VPC? See, if it is hard right now to implement these principles, it will be harder when we move into the cycle because you are fixing things in a moving train and fixing things in a moving train is not an easy thing. Now, once we have defined our day zero strategies, there's something that we need to do every day, right? Every day. One thing which I realized, so I think uh, as an engineer, we like solving problems. Now, people who like solving problems will always think about solutions. Is it the right approach? Sometime. Is it the right approach every time? Clearly no. So first, whenever we are trying to solve a problem, we need to first understand that what has made that problem origin. Is it the real problem or is there any other problem that we have to solve? So that problem thinking in, um, needs to be inculcated within your team. Ask them questions, ask them questions and push them to ask questions back. Create an environment where there are a lot of questions and only few solutions. Because that is the time when you have really identified the core problems or you have started talking about problems and not only about solutions. Because when you talk about solution, you bias your problem basis your solution. And the actual problem which you wanted to solve will never get solved. Now, the second thing, you'll have endless things to do when you scale from MVP, right? You, you need to do the core engineering re re-architecture. There are 10 business features that are lying in. The product team has just thought of something wonderful to build you need to prioritize them and don't prioritize by emotions or hierarchy prioritize with that them by metrics. You might not have metrics for some of the things, but it is not that you might not have complete metrics. You would not have direct metrics. You can compute indirect metrics and also think about the ROI. Just don't think about that. This is a hard problem for an engineer to solve. We'll definitely solve it. And we take two months to solve a problem. And then what we realize, Oh, the ROI is pretty less. So we, whenever we are prioritizing, just keep in mind that those metrics, those ROIs are driven and driving these matrices. The third thing, obviously, see, when we started, most of the team members in our team are these young people, young engineers, these, the, these young blood coming out of college. They know how to code. They know how to engineer. They know how to system design. But do they know how to carve out those sands from the big rock, which is your milestone. And then again, sand, does do the sandboxing and ship the big rock. So this is the time when the engineering leaders should spend time with their team in basically breaking those big rocks, those big epics into smaller tasks, helping them learn on how can they build smaller, smaller tasks and basically ship the big rock. I myself uh, for the first six, seven months have been doing this myself. Now the real struggle that me and my team faced uh, that most of us were not able to understand what are the sand or what are those sand that will be boxed to deliver the big rock? What are those smaller tasks that can deliver the story? We thought that these are, yeah, we used to do tasks. We will do tasks. Somebody will break story for us. Don't do that. Help them learn as you break. So you do the heavy lifting in the initial phases and then help your team grow with it. Now, the fourth important thing is basically whenever you're building a solution, whenever you're solving a complex engineering problem, you need to think, can you build it uh, for short term or you have to build it for long term? Align with your business roadmap and then you'll understand. If this is like a six month problem, we don't have a complete understanding on how it will look like. Don't try solving it the right engineering way. It is something which is not your core. Fail fast, build it in a fail fast fashion so that you can basically iterate, improve, iterate, improve. Don't go for long term. At the same time, if something is your core, so for example, for us, our underwriting is our core. Do we want to build it in a fail fast fashion? Obviously not. It is something which is for long term. So something which is for long term, just focus that it is being solved in a long term fashion, but something which is a fail fast, solve it in a fail fast fashion. A lot of times we face challenge that this context switching is pretty difficult when to fail fast, when to long term. We as leaders have to kind of inculcate this practice in the team and use our uh, engineering hat to help them take this decision. Every day, think about the observability cycle. 
I think most of us would have read uh, read the SRE books of Google. Google from day one have a SRE team have kind of those uh, dashboards monitoring matrices, and that is the reason Google is Google. So we can learn uh, some good points about that. That we can build our observability cycle by taking one step at a time every day. If we don't take those step at a time every day, what would happen after a couple of years that you'll have to kind of introduce or inculcate those logging designs, those logging principles in each and every part of your code, which then becomes a three month project. So rather than making a three month project, we need to uh, kind of uh, focus on the observability cycle. And I think each one of us, us understand, right? The importance of observability. It is important to know what your customer is experiencing. Ultimate goal of a product is to enrich the customer experience. So it is important to know what issues they are facing. How can we solve it? How can we kind of solve it in like 10 minutes? Can there be self-heal automation for that? Do we have enough logging to understand that there is an issue? So tying up those things in at a stretch would not happen. You need to step today to do it. And uh, last point, so I think uh, Abhinav, uh, our co-CEO, it's his favorite line that while we should always measure ourselves with output, but we should celebrate with our input. So those are small wins that you've taken, which is obviously not right now looking into your end goal or pitching into your end big goal, you celebrate it. Don't just get demotivated that we are not able to achieve those targets. We are not able to reach there. We were supposed to deliver like 80 story points and we were supposed to have like 100x users without any scaling issues. Why are we not able to have it? Were you able to scale to 50x? If yes, celebrate it. Don't just get demotivated. It is very important to run, keep running the motivation cycle of ourselves and as well as our team because all thanks to pandemic, most of us are remote working, working at our home. This becomes a critical driver for us to basically get aligned with the business. Now, once uh, uh, we have defined our day zero strategies, we have those everyday hustle. As a leader, what we can do is we can anticipate and then act. The first and very important point, it is not an engineering point. It is an overall point that we build the right hiring strategy. When we say we build the right hiring strategy, it means that we need to define on how many people we actually need rather than just blindly going that let's hire for now and we'll see later. The second thing is hire people who are smarter than you. Everybody says it, right? Amazon says it, Google says it, Uber says it. Hire people who are smarter than you. Trust me, when we hire people smarter than you, they challenge you to your core, which makes the system even more better. Don't get shy away on hiring people who are smarter than you. Emphasis on your team's growth roadmap. Now, you know engineers, right? What do, what do engineers want? Engineers want smarter people around. They need, need harder problems to solve. And they need some bit of uh, fun going through the way. Now, to help your engineers enjoy the journey for a longer duration, you need to define a roadmap for, map for them. How can a SD1 can become SD2? How can an SD2 become as tough? A person, a persona, how that person is fitting right now into this thing. Start investing in this. It is very important because what would happen, you'll build a MVP, you'll spend like a couple of years and then you realize some of your core people have started demotivating. Now, the third point, which we discussed in the day zero strategy as well, I think build for 99% of the user. Don't try solving 100% problem all the time. Don't try solving those complex edge cases. Even the system design theory says that there can be system limitations. Know your limitations, but don't build a complex solution that would impact 100% of the time. So basically we should focus on just building 90 for 99%. Developer productivity is an important, important, important aspect. Inefficient branching strategies, zero, automation in your deployment, no automation in test, no quality breaks. Everything falls apart once your team grows. And everybody, while they are just putting more than 100, 120, 
everybody's frustrated, right? I am putting my 150% in this project, but my project is not going at the time and it should have gone, gone. Why? We don't have a defined CICD. We don't know what is to be automated. We don't have a defined branching strategy. That person merged in the code into my branch and there's a merge conflict. Focus on the developer productivity, guys. It is very important. We need to set that DevOps culture from day one to help our developers grow. And as we said, you cannot implement everything from day one, but set up that culture so that you slowly, slowly, slowly put uh, levers to this function. Whenever there's a failure, how, how do we react? Generally, I'm adding a couple of years back, I used to be frustrated. I used to talk to that person, that why this happened? Why are you missed? What was going wrong? And, and then I realized I'm just asking those wrong questions every time to, to that individual. Had that individual known that this would be the mistake, that individual wouldn't have done it. So transform these fail failures into learning and not as learning for that one individual who has done the mistake, who has just leaked the production bug. Make this as a learning for the entire team. So the next time this entire team is not doing the same mistake. Don't just make your people go in a defensive mode by saying why this has broken. Sit with them and understand, empathize on why that has broken and help find a solution. The last and the very important point, I think this is something which we, we miss that we are building MVP, right? We don't need automation. We'll hire some manual QA people and they'll do test. Now those manual QA in the starting, the thing three hours to do the regression as your product become more complex, complex, they'll take a, take a week. Now, do you really want to spend a week when your development is ready and you want to ship and that too? In a startup environment, you don't focus on automation, focus on the quality gating, unit testing. Don't just introduce us like a, in a go, every new feature from day 10 will go with the unit test. Every new feature from day 30th will go with an API documentation. Every new feature from day 45th will go with your automation. Think, start thinking about those lines. This will not all only not only improve your quality, but also it will ensure that you have the same speed as you had in the beginning and a better quality that you had in the beginning. Now, those are things that we can do, right? We can strategize at day zero. We can then do those daily hustles and then we can anticipate an act as something that we should not do. And in our personal experience, we thought that these are things that we should avoid. Don't hire without the clarity of roadmap. And this, I think uh, I've been talking about a lot that we should not just blindly go on hiring. See, a simple solution to every problem is hiring. Whenever we stuck, get stuck in a problem, what we say, let's hire more people. That is not the way. When you're hiring someone, you are responsible for their career as well. It is not only that that person is responsible for the organization's growth. As a leader, it is important for you that you are responsible for that person's growth as well. So hire with clarity of at least the roadmap for that person when you're hiring. Don't do false commitments. If you're doing something and you're not doing something, just be very transparent with the candidate so that that candidate can take a trustful decision with you and being be very transparent. With that. Don't try reinventing the build wheel. If somebody has built something, there's a lot of things in the open source market. Don't try reinventing it. Building a notification engine again might be useful to you, but you really need to build. So you need to understand when to build versus when to buy. So anything that is important to your core, we need to build it. But anything which is not important to our core and can be bought or can be like taken from some open source uh, repository, we should really try utilizing it. Now, when you have moved from the MVP to a scaling kind of an architecture, we cannot rely on picking up half cooked stories. We cannot just pick a story that has not solved the entire business problem. Because what would happen? We'll then build that story. And after three weeks, we'll be rebuilding that story. So stop picking those half cooked stories until and unless it is a business urgency. Stop picking it. The last and important point is until and unless you align the business goals with your engineering goals, 
you will not be able to stitch that roadmap of scaling with the business. So align the business goals with your engineering goals. Maybe in your OKRs have one section for uh, engineering or things like that, but we should do. So I think this is pretty much, I think from our experiences on what we tried building, I think uh, just taking a reflection on one, whenever we want to scale and there are some things that we need to do at day zero. So we should try focusing those things on day zero and then the focus on the everyday hustle, anticipate and act and the things too, we should avoid. So these were pretty much uh, some of the things that uh, I wanted to touch upon. This is my experience. Uh, I think we can move to the Q&A section and help answer some of the challenges that each one of you have faced or would think you will face. Ankita, we can move to the Q&A section. Yeah. Um, thanks, Anirudh. That was a wonderful session. I request all the participants who ever has question, uh, please put it in the chat box so that the speaker can take it ahead. Yeah, Anirudh, I see some questions here. You'll take it up? Yeah, yeah. I think Akshay asked the building MVP with no code versus hiring CTO. It's a very good question. I think uh, Akshay brilliantly um, uh, asked. Uh, and like the question, like right? there's no real answer. See, what do we define as an MVP? Do we define as an MVP? And it depends on the product. Are we going B2C or B2B? If our MVP we know is going to like get successful in like couple of weeks with those anticipation or couple of months. You don't need to really hire a CTO at the starting, but you need to hire a senior leader. The starting team can be a team of interns working with the senior leader, because as you written, right? Building MVP with no code. The reason if you build MVP with no code and you have to scale in two weeks, there's no chance you're going to scale. So you should understand that if you have to scale and when you have to scale, again, going back to the day zero strategies, how much time it will take if you take that no, no code approach. No code approach is, I think, okay. If it is like MVP is like very initial phase, right? It's like, we're just doing beta alpha. It is not like a product launch, but if we have a product launch with an MVP, I think no code would not help us. So I think, uh, um, uh, I hope I answered your question. I'll just probably go to the other question. I think Shayas asked a good question. Uh, how do you handle core developers leaving the company in between an Epic? Uh, so I think Shayas, I think uh, we touched upon, right? Uh, that we need to keep the motivation high, have roadmap, career roadmap for those individuals. And that will keep them motivated and won't let them leave. But in reality, they will leave. One important thing that we need to understand is that uh, we need to design our system or code the system in such a way that there is no dependency inculcated on one person. Now, this is theory. In practical, there will be dependency on your rock stars. And if that rock star leaves, See, before that rock star leaving, you should have a roadmap. If one day this rock star leaves, what are those 10 things that I need to do? You, if you have that checklist, I think you have that answer. I need to basically get, get the KT done with some people. I need to hire immediately. What are those key challenges I would need to solve? What are those things that this person only know? Can I get them documented? So it's a mix of documentation of the core aspect of that person plus any, any, anything else I think we will be able to achieve it. It is not 100% solvable, but yeah, trust me, I think with some of those checklists before even that core person leaving, you can help you. And I think I would suggest go one step back, try motivating each and every individual, keep your top 1% more highly motivated so that they don't leave. So I think I will go with the next question that Limra asked, uh, should we start building for scale from very beginning during MVP phase? So I think uh, as we discussed, right, uh, whenever we are building in an MVP, we know what our core is and we know what the features are. We should never build features for scale 
because those features are generally by the biases of our market read and is not actually based on the user experience. Those will get scrapped. Uh, we, build our, we build our onboarding journeys like n number of times because we knew that while we are solving the problem, we have to fail fast. Had we, we built for scale, we would have failed. So whenever you are building your MVP, remember the core should be built for scale. The features can be built in a slightly hackish fashion. What should be ideal PM de uh, developer ratio? I think uh, my uh, CPO, my product guy would have answered this question well, but I'll try answering. So I think once we, when we started, uh, we were able to operate in a beautiful fashion with uh, product to developer ratio 15 is to one. This was going fine in the MVP phases because we had uh, slightly similar features, uh, some of them really core features and some of them simpler features, which we were able to manage. And as a mix of handshaking, see, one thing which we need to understand that product and engineering are not two verticals. These are two wheels of a bike that make it run together. So whenever you think the product team needs some help with the documentation, why can't, why can't your QA just do that uh, extra documentation for the team? So we can start with a 10 is to 1 or 12 is to 1 ratio, but obviously once we have to inculcate those actual practices for scale, maybe 6 is to 1, the, the idle pod size is what most of the reads recommend. I'll go to the next question. How can we ensure product security in terms of data servers while scaling the product? So I think Pavan, very good question. Uh, I think the answer is that rather than thinking about this problem, when we are scaling the product, we should have thought a step back in our day zero strategy. We should have clearly defined that if the data is going to get stored, if it is a PII, how will we store it? Where will we store it? Define those, define those strategies from day one. How will we store it? Where will we store it? What things will happen? Implement VPC, private VPC from day one. Keep your private VPC from day one. So these kind of things, if we do from day one, I think we would not face challenges in scale. Obviously, have if we have moved from day one and now we are at that scale, what we can probably do that whatever newer development is happening is happening with those guidelines. And then we slowly, slowly, slowly picking in each and every sprint, the backlog that is created. Cool. Uh, I'll just uh, go to the next, next question. Uh, DevOps cycle needs to be implemented for development and should be adopted dev stage and product environment from day one. I think Ramya, uh, it's a good question, but I think if we implement DevOps cycle from day one, we'll invest a lot of time in building it. There's a difference in building the DevOps strategy from day one versus implementing the DevOps strategy from day one. So define as a leader, you should define your DevOps strategy from day one, that this will be the ideal CI, CD pipeline that will look like. This will be my monitoring framework on day one don't make so many environments don't make your life complicated even if you're not live why do you need a separate prod or a dev environment test it on the dark side environment you don't have traffic right why do you want to invest that extra cost both in terms of uh, server resources and in terms of time but at the same time we should define a devops strategy ankita i think uh, pretty much done with the questions yeah nirud thank you for uh, all the uh, questions to the participants and uh, anirudh you were excellent at delivering this lecture uh, i think uh, you gave away uh, the speak uh, the participants the best uh, uh, lessons to learn in the mvp to a full fresh product journey uh, starting from life cycle to the actual state identification and the common challenges, etc. It was wonderful uh, uh, with good motivation lines as well in between. Thank you so much for that, Anirudh. 
and you. i hope uh, uh, the uh, participant here have uh, taken the best benefit of uh, this session and um, yeah with that uh, i would like to say uh, once again to the participants that uh, there is a chat in the chat box there is uh, anirudh's email address mentioned in case of any questions you can reach out to him as well and uh, thank you so much for being here ricker club team uh, thank you so much anirudh uh, thanks for the wonderful talk yeah, yeah. Thank thank you. You. i think uh, it was wonderful and uh, i think the participants were engaging it looked like an interaction yeah and and these are just some and as i said these are some of the practices that we developed from our experiences you guys will face new challenges just in just inculcate that problem thinking in you yeah. just don't jump into the solution i think you'll we'll be able to solve all the challenges that you face that's wonderful line for the participants and participants i request you to uh, just fill the feedback form that's there in the chat box this would really help for us for the further sessions thanks thanks uh, to all of you for joining us thanks anirudh thank you thank have you everyone have yeah. a good bye bye